Hello and welcome. I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of UCLA Anderson, and I'm honored to welcome you to the 2021 Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference, UCLA's largest annual conference focused on the Greater China region. We're especially excited about this year's conference as it highlights UCLA Anderson's broad and deep capabilities and partnerships, including our key relationships with alumni, industry leaders, students, and departments across the UCLA campus. Our talented faculty and academic centers at Anderson, including our host and organizing center, the Center for Global Management, and its deep relationship with the Eastern, Easton Center for Technology Management. This is part of an overarching initiative at UCLA Anderson to enhance our ability to work across boundaries, to learn and work in an interdisciplinary manner, to work across the many important programs and schools we have here at UCLA, to connect academia and industry, to work across geographies, and to work between business and society. These are critical leadership imperatives that our students and community must appreciate and excel at. And this would not be possible without the long-term invaluable and generous support of the family of Wilbur K. Wu, whose legacy we celebrate with this annual conference. Born in 1916 in a village near Guangzhou in Southern China, Wilbur Wu received his bachelor's degree in business administration from UCLA in 1942. He went on to become a major figure in LA's business, political, cultural, and charitable arenas, and was known for his decades of leadership in the Chinese American community. Global reach starts with global thinking. And two, days, two decades ago, recognizing the rapid expansion and modernization of China's economy, Wilbur Wu, the vice chairman of Cathay Bank, and his wife, Beth, endowed the Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference at UCLA to show their gratitude for the training Wilbur had received at his alma mater. The Wu's are represented here today by their son, Michael Wu. The Wu's goal was to facilitate dialogue, promote understanding, and strengthen the important ties between the Greater China region and the United States. To identify areas of collective opportunity, foster cooperation, and bring a group of leaders, both aspiring and current, together to collaborate and to learn together. That goal feels especially important at this time in the United States, when racism and violence against Asians and Pacific Islanders are shamefully on the rise. Conferences like this one have a powerful and positive impact on our community here at UCLA and beyond. I would like to acknowledge and thank all our guest speakers and moderators who are joining us from all over the world, including UCLA and UCLA Anderson alumni. I'd also like to thank our gold sponsor, Cathay Bank, our silver sponsor, Land Sea Homes, and our partners, including the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, the China General Chamber of, Com of Commerce, Los Angeles, the UCLA Asia Pacific Center, and UCLA Center for Chinese Studies, as well as our student organizations, UCLA's Chinese Students and Scholars Association and Anderson's Greater China Business Association. And a special thank you to the Wu family for their continued support and enthusiasm around the focus of this year's conference on technology-based innovation. In normal times, a large group of our MBA students would have just returned from Shenzhen and Hong Kong, where in non-pandemic years, they are able to learn and witness firsthand the remarkable innovations and tech transformations happening in the region. While we look forward to resuming those on-the-ground experiences, we are pleased this year to be able to highlight these same issues for a broader global audience. Technology is a key focus for us at UCLA Anderson. Leaders in every industry must understand the role of technology, tap its opportunities, mitigate negative externalities, and be prepared to lead in a world that is increasingly technology-based. Finally, let me welcome and thank each of you for joining us. Whether you're a student, faculty member, an Anderson alum, or a member of industry, your engagement this week brings learning and impact. Now it's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend of Anderson's, a pioneer in Los Angeles political circles, and a strong and positive force in the Los Angeles community. Michael Wu was the first Asian American elected to the Los Angeles City Council. He is Dean Emeritus of the College of Environmental Design at Cal Poly Pomona, and he's the son of Wilbur Kay and Beth Wu. We are so grateful to Michael and to the Wu family for endowing this important conference and for their ongoing engagement, support, and partnership with us. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dean Bernardo. And uh, 
On behalf of the Wu family, uh, we want to express our deep gratitude to you and the Anderson School for your continuing commitment to the Wu Conference and to our father's vision of UCLA as a bridge between the United States and the greater China region. For the conference attendees who never had the opportunity to meet Wilbur Wu, I'd like to tell you a little about him. Wilbur Wu was an international student at UCLA back in the days when Westwood saw very few students from China. Born in a small village in Guangdong province, our father's first two years of higher education were at the old Lingnan College campus in Guangzhou, one of the handful of institutions started by Western missionaries from in China. But transferring to UCLA opened up the door to a great career and a great life. Uh, our father always wanted to find a way to repay his debt to his alma mater and hence this conference. Uh, Dad was always was particularly gratified to see the success of the conference hinging largely upon the hard work of students, especially international students whom he saw as following in his footsteps. Our father also would be gratified to know that a leader of technology and industry on the level of Dr. Kai-Fu Lee has agreed to be the keynote speaker. Unlike our mother, Beth Wu, who as a senior citizen joined a group to learn computer skills, our dad never had an email address, never had a social media account, and probably would have had to stretch to try to explain the meaning of artificial intelligence. But dad knew that technology was something important, something transformative. He was very proud of the fact that his granddaughter, Nicole, and his grandson, Scott, worked for companies such as Google and Twitter. Nicole, who's in the audience today, was deputy general counsel at Google when Dr. Lee was the head of Google, Google China and occasionally had reasons to discuss legal strategy with him. At a time when US-China relations continues to be volatile, and also at a time when Chinese Americans and Asian Americans are squarely at the center of a reckoning on race relations in the United States, it's timely to remember that Wilbur Wu used to believe that it was always useful for people to try to talk to each other. In that spirit, on behalf of the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and the in-laws of Wilbur and Beth Wu, thank you all for being part of the 2021 edition of the Wu Conference and for keeping Wilbur Wu's vision alive. Thank you. Michael, uh, let me just first say a big thank you for your uh, warm words. I want to thank you for your support of this conference, your vision of the, the conference. I'd also like to thank our Dean, Tony Bernardo, for his work in creating bridges and bridges across UCLA Anderson, bridges across the broader UCLA community, and bridges across the Pacific. All of that is gonna allow us to really kind of tap into the best learnings and ensure relevance on a global stage. Now, as many of you know, we made the difficult decision last year to cancel the conference, which was slated to focus on China's rapidly advancing technology ecosystem. As any technologist knows, necessity is the mother of invention. So this year, we've moved the conference online for the first time ever. We're excited that all the sessions will be available to students, to educators, to policymakers, and people all over the world, including in China. And the themes that were originally planned in 2020 are even more relevant today. I'm very excited about the opportunity this year with this conference to focus exclusively on the dynamic areas of technology-based innovation that are occurring in the region and how it's transforming the lives of consumers, of enterprises and of society overall. I believe there are many areas of critical learnings to come from the region, how technology can be used to advance offerings in areas such as education, healthcare, financial services and manufacturing. 
I remember when we were putting this conference together, my early days at Vodafone with its 28 wireless country operations and the mantra about learning uh, best practices from across the globe to learn from other places and adapt them for your own market and to advance the cause of technology innovation for the benefit of everyone. I hope that you find that this week's conference gives you a glimpse into the successes in the greater China region and the related learnings for all of us. Now to accomplish all of this, we've organized a conference into four days this week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday evening Pacific time. That's obviously Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday morning in the greater China region local time. Each day will have its own focus. So today we're gonna to take a broader look at the innovation imperative and outcomes in the region. Tomorrow, we're gonna to focus on innovation in internet services. Thursday, we're gonna look at the incredible innovations in high-tech manufacturing. And Friday, we're gonna look at innovation in FinTech and the tech sector investment environment. Each session is gonna uh, feature incredible speakers and also moderation. And our moderators are leaders in their own right here at UCLA and from industry. Now, first, let me share a couple of ground rules and philosophical underpinnings about the conference and at UCLA more broadly. First of all, the US-China relationship is a long and a deep one. With any relationship, there can be complexities and areas of disagreement, especially with a community as diverse as UCLA. These differences are understandable and they're appreciated. We hope to build positive channels between the US and China with this conference in areas of mutual interest, technology innovation, especially in the areas of societal need. We hope that these will further help each of us on our leadership journey and also to build a greater understanding. As such, we will be focusing the discussion and the related Q&A on areas of technology-based innovation, avoiding political and or polit uh, polarizing topics, which could derail us from the important insights and learnings we have set as our objectives. We appreciate your understanding and alignment on this vision for the conference and its objectives. I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge as Dean Bernardo has and Michael Wu has about the recent attacks on Asian Americans. These attacks are antithetical to our values as a nation and at UCLA, and they violate the belief that we have that one plus one should equal three in terms of the diversity of our community bringing greater gains than people working independently. I hope you'll enjoy the conference, contribute and engage with it, and that this conference builds our collective understanding about the transformative impact that technology can have on consumers, on enterprises, and on society. Now let me get started with the next part of the program. Um, I'd like to provide a little bit of context and then obviously an introduction of our very distinguished keynote speaker. First to start with some context. The global pandem pandemic has made it clear more than ever that technology is playing a foundational role in our lives as individuals and more broadly as society. Can you imagine what the last year would have been without services such as e-commerce, streaming solutions, video conferencing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Microsoft Teams has added 95 million new users in 2020. From March to June alone, it grew by almost 900%. Sales of Zoom have grown by 326% in 2020, and their profits have grown from what was $22 million last year to $672 million this year. According to the mobile analytics firm App Annie, spending on in-app purchases in the first quarter of 2021 has reached $32 billion, a 40% increase year over year. These are just snapshots, but they emphasize how fundamental technology is and how it continues to grow radically day by day. AI looms large in this arena and the US and China are dominating. According to the market research firm CB Insights, there are 610 tech unicorns at the moment defined as startups 
with valuations exceeding a billion dollars, and 49 of them are in the area of artificial intelligence. Fully 23 of those are in the United States, 15 are in China. The next closest country is the UK with only four of these unicorns. Now let me introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, who we are so excited and grateful to have as our keynote speaker for this year's conference. Dr. Lee is deeply admired in the US, in China, and across the world as one of the most foremost experts in technology and in artificial intelligence, and has been a keen observer of the impact of technology on society. He's a world-renowned expert on AI and has worked on artificial intelligence for over three decades and has made breakthroughs using machine learning for speech and games early in his career. He was the founding president of Google China and Microsoft Research Asia and a longtime investor in Chinese startups. Dr. Li founded Sinovation Ventures in 2009, managing over $2.5 billion in venture capital, investing in more than 400 companies, including 18 unicorn with seven in AI. Dr. Lee is also the co-chair of the Artificial Intelligence Council for the World Economic Forum and was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. As, uh, as to the format of today's session, Dr. Lee will be sharing opening comments around the theme of technology-driven transformations, innovation, and the role of AI. And from there, I'll ask him a set of questions that delve further into the key issues and insights and draw upon his career. We'll then take audience questions using the Slido platform. For those that are joining the conference platform, you'll see Slido embedded at the bottom of your screen. Please type in your questions there. You can either enter your own question or you can upvote one of the existing questions. We'll obviously endeavor to uh, have the most popular questions posed. It is now my pleasure to welcome virtually Dr. Kai Fu Lee. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much. It's a real honor to speak to uh, all of you at the UCLA China Conference. And uh, I want to share uh, my experience in artificial intelligence. Uh, in a sense, it's the technology that I thought would really highlight the capabilities of China and US and bring opportunities for the two countries to work together. The last point seems a little bit difficult at present, but I remain optimistic um, in, in the long term. Uh, well, I'm gonna share my slides now. And so in this talk today, <clears throat> I will give a brief introduction of what is AI, uh, followed by the rise of AI in China and then new developments in China and US in light of COVID and projecting out uh, over the next uh, 20 years on what opportunities uh, lie ahead. So what is AI? You know, when we first think about it, we probably think it is something that is to replace the human brain. And in fact, that is called general AI. It's creating an AI engine that is in every way, shape or form uh, equivalent or better than humans. But I think that is a kind of a narcissistic tendency of humans to compare everything to us, to our brains. Uh, what AI really is today is we are nowhere uh, in building the general AI because there are many aspects of human creativity and compassion uh, that we don't know how to do with AI. Uh, uh, and, and AI actually, the part of AI that works well is called narrow AI. And that is taking AI applied to a specific problem with, and training it with so much data that it excels uh, well beyond human capabilities. So the, the AI, when we talk about AI today, we're talking about algorithms that on specific problems with proper training data can beat human by orders of magnitude. But in terms of our general ability to reason and think and create and love, um, AI doesn't come close. It is really a different way of thinking, um, never really intended to follow the human thinking process. And um, uh, so it does a lot better on some things, uh, but it doesn't do many of the things we do generally. Now, this may become confusing when you look at the headlines, right? You see AI beating human in Go, something that's considered the um, 
best example of human wisdom and um, uh, intelligence, beating doctors and in neural imaging, uh, uh, and uh, now with AI able to generate text that appears to be amazing in content and actually beating uh, uh, humans in a scientific endeavor of protein folding, something that has puzzled uh, biology researchers for 50 years has now been solved by AI. So these progress would certainly have you think AI is trying to uh, push us into a corner. Uh, but in fact, these are all tasks that are quite suitable for AI. And that huge uh, revolution in AI came uh, around uh, 10 years ago when deep learning uh, began to be published and began to be applied around five years ago in very pervasive ways. It is by far the greatest disruption. And, it, and then let me talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, deep learning basically works by taking a massive amount of data uh, with very accurate label. So what is a label? Well, you, you label <clears throat> an object. Um, <clears throat> you label, label objects with the people and uh, their identities and computers and phones on, in, a, in an image and have a computer learn that. Similarly, you can label um, in a financial application good borrowers versus bad borrowers good borrowers being those who return their money, bad borrowers being those who default. And you train a system that learns how to select good borrowers out of a pool of applicants and improve your insurance um, uh, company's financial success. And it can be applied to uh, Amazon where whatever you buy ends up being labeling the path of your click through so that other people who clicked the way you did or bought the things that you did are likely to buy the things that um, that you just bought. So AI basically trains on huge amount of data and, and labels and basically very accurate labels. And it tends to work well in a single domain. So if you think about a a large uh, Excel on uh, steroids. That's often the way I try to relate AI and deep learning to people who are not familiar with it. Think of it as a giant, huge Excel, where you enter all the data you know about something and you describe an outcome and you push a button and it computes and it tells you what decision, prediction or classification it makes. AI makes requires a lot of computation power and uh, requires AI experts to tweak the data. So these are the five key things that make AI work. Uh, pick a single domain, collect a large amount of data, uh, train the system and run it. It can be applied to uh, obviously most to industries where there's plentiful data. So that's why uh, companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and Alibaba, and Tencent, and ByteDance have become super successful because they possess the most data. Every time we click on a Facebook or Amazon or, or Google page, we're providing data. We're describing intentionality. We're describing that's something I'm interested in, I'm spending time looking at it, or I'm buying it. Uh, therefore, it will learn not only on what I want to do, but also other people like me. And, and the other power of AI is that it can target each person differently. So that when I go on Amazon and when you go on it, it's recommended purchases are different because it know my, my past history is different from yours. Uh, so static web pages and um, human driven algorithms cannot do that. So AI can really accurately based on data, uh, learn to optimize and that's the power of AI. AI doesn't have any of the other things that humans do. Uh, and that's why when, when people ask the question of can AI love, can AI create some new economic theory or make the uh, next um, uh, Picasso, it, it cannot. It can replicate, it can uh, optimize, but it cannot invent. So apply to different industries is not surprising that first AI applications are from the bottom of the page, apply to internet where data is the most plentiful. And that's why Google, Amazon, Facebook have become the most powerful and valuable companies, as well as the companies that possess the greatest number of AI practitioners, as well as AI driven data. 
Uh, next, AI can be applied uh, to any domain with a lot of data. So naturally financial services, uh, banking, insurance, investments, and pretty much any other enterprise applications become possible candidates. Uh, you could imagine uh, these Zoom sessions becoming uh, hugely valuable data uh, to interpret um, what people say and how audiences react and, and they can learn intelligent things from that to build uh, better products. Uh, thirdly, AI will is actually gaining uh, the power of perception. That is, AI can see and hear. Speech recognition uh, already works better for AI compared to humans. Uh, object recognition is improving rapidly for specific uh, objects, objects in fixed images. AI also does better than people. And what's more is that human perception is mostly vision and uh, hearing. But for, com for computers, AI can sense a lot more than that. You can sense uh, temperature, uh, humidity, can sense uh, 3D reconstruction, even in the dark, that is equivalent to seeing in the dark. Um, and, um, and, and you can sense motion. So AI can sense a lot more than people. So if AI can do as well as people in vision um, and in, 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 in speech, uh, then AI can do a lot more with these additional sensors and IOTs that will become all the more intelligent. And then the fourth wave is when AI starts to move around, uh, gaining the power of motion and uh, manipulation. Then you can create AI that will uh, do agriculture, manufacturing, uh, warehouses, autonomous vehicles, robotics, assembly, uh, delivery of goods. So if you apply AI through these four waves, uh, it is surely going to disrupt all industries that are uh, imaginable. And, and I think AI will really enable and empower, in some cases, disrupt uh, these uh, industries. And I often talk about AI as uh, the new electricity because it's one of those uh, big general purpose technologies. That's not just a point technology that improves one aspect of work, but it is an omni-use technology that is a platform, just like electricity was, and uh, just like computers and internet were, that can create opportunities uh, to create value, save time, uh, make money, and um, uh, help take over repetitive routine work for us. So that's what AI is really all about. So the narrow AI implemented through deep learning uh, is now beginning to penetrate all kinds of industries. Uh, I think over the next 20 years, we're going to see a lot more changes, although it's already creating a huge uh, <clears throat> uh, impact in the society. Uh, as you heard earlier, it's created some 25 unicorns in the uh, US and something like um, uh, 15 unicorns in China and it's rapidly increasing. And actually, uh, sounds like US has more unicorns, but actually the most uh, valuable AI unicorn is in China. Uh, it's ByteDance and the company that builds TikTok. It's privately valued over the $300 billion right now. So if you measure by value, I think China is ahead. If you measure by numbers, US is ahead. So speaking of China, let's go into the next topic about AI in China. And as you heard in the 60 minute introduction, this is over about a book that I wrote almost three years ago. And these really are the seven key points that I made in the book. And I'll go, I will be uh, talking more about the key points here. So. Uh, so if you uh, have trouble paying attention to the next 10 minutes of my talk, just remember the seven key points are, at number one, AI is no longer rocket science. It is becoming mainstream and with the four waves we talked about. Secondly, AI is the new electricity because it's omni-use. Number three, AI is the new oil because, uh, sorry, data is the new oil because if AI uh, cannot be trained on concepts like people are, AI is trained on data. So if data is the new oil, then China is the new Saudi Arabia, bringing huge opportunities with the number of people creating more data in China. Therefore, China with its capabilities of building uh, great entrepreneurs and startups, plus with all the data, China will co-lead AI with the US. When I made this point three years ago, it was a little bit 
controversial. Some people didn't believe it, but I think now it's becoming clear. Uh, number five is that China will probably lead with internet just because there are more people online. China will probably lead with automation because China has more factories that it has to automate. Uh, U.S. will lead in research. All the key technologies have been mostly invented by the U.S. And U.S. will lead in enterprise applications because <clears throat> that in that area, U.S. leads China by far, and that will create huge amount of data in the enterprise. So I think these six predictions have been uh, quite accurate in that in that book. Uh, the last uh, a prediction I think will just remain a wishful thinking that I think all of us uh, hold in our hearts. So. Chinese AI is in the last few years has been all over headlines. Uh, we clearly see uh, China having a lot of success with its entrepreneurs, with this large amount of data, uh, and also with um, uh, smart government programs that have propelled it forward. And I would say that in as described in the book, the six key things that made China into an AI superpower. Right. China was clearly uh, a laggard uh, 10 years ago in almost every imaginable IT air industry. But in the last 10 years, six things gave China the opportunity to leap ahead and basically catch up with the US. Uh, right now, I think China and US are just about neck and neck if you evaluate all the different aspects of AI. China has a huge number of AI engineers. Computer science is the most softer, sought after. Um, a degree with AI being the hottest area that pays more. Secondly, China has very tough entrepreneurs who compete uh, tenaciously uh, in the winner take all environment. I uh, don't have a lot of time to go into that. Uh, in my book, I use the example of Meituan, uh, which uh, is one of the most tenacious companies that went up to challenge Alibaba. And in the US, you wouldn't imagine that to be doable. Uh, who could ch challenge Amazon? But Meituan, uh, since I published my book, Meituan has gone public and its stock has gone over, um, gone up as much as eight times, uh, currently six times at about $225 billion, uh, putting a serious challenge to Alibaba uh, because it is the uh, delivery company for food in China. And when you can deliver food and meals at 70 cents per delivery, uh, you, you can challenge e-commerce because you're delivering things in 30 minutes, not in two days, right? If you can imagine DoorDash becoming huge, its delivery capacities could challenge Amazon, but it would be my bet that DoorDash founders don't have that ambition, but the Chinese entrepreneurs such as Wang Xing and Meituan does. Uh, ByteDance is placing a serious challenge on Tencent, something also not imaginable that you wouldn't imagine Snapchat could really dislodge Facebook. But the Chinese entrepreneurs have that tenacity. And as I mentioned, uh, ByteDance is now close to a billion daily active users, more than half of uh, Tencent's. And it's uh, winning more minutes per user. It's creating more value per, per user. And it's creating a, a wide array of products, including successful products overseas, such as TikTok. And its market valuation is also now closing in to maybe a, a third or a quarter of Tencent, but going up much more fast, much faster than Tencent. Um, third is really the outcome is that uh, China has developed a parallel universe in terms of what the Chinese internet looks like. Um, in many ways, I think the Chinese internet is much more efficient. Uh, if you, for me, uh, let's put it this way: for for my personal life, uh, in order to make myself, you know, well fed and um, uh, get all the good things I need to buy, make my family happy and entertain and be entertained, um, and get all my news and all my readings from the internet and connect with my friends and communicate with them, I would say the Chinese apps are probably saving me an hour a day out of you know, you know, a few hours online for personal activities. So much more efficient than the American apps. Uh, the enterprise is a different story, as I mentioned. So the fourth reason is now with the Chinese apps taking so many minutes per user, 
uh, ByteDance uh, today through its Douyin and Toutiao apps are taking more than 100 minutes per user, well more than the equivalent American app. So China has the advantage of having more users and more usage per person, and that creates more data and trains better AI. Uh, as a result, China's AI funding in number five uh, has actually basically caught up with the U.S. It's neck and neck, depending on which year you look at. And finally, it's uh, support from the government uh, that has been helpful. Uh, note that I put this as number six, because if you read the Western media, they would have you think it's, it's, that's the primary reason. But I would say uh, probably 90 percent of the credit goes to the Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe a few percent goes to the VCs like myself, and certainly some goes to the government. But I think the key things the government does has done is to create um, a techno utilitarian environment that supports innovation and and uh, create incentive programs uh, for cities to to give incentives to attract top entrepreneurs and to build infrastructure, something that commercial companies can't afford to do. So let's quickly go over some of these key things. Uh, we know the US still leads in research. All the Turing Award recipients um, basically are, are North American, Chinese, um, uh, Ameri Ch uh, Americans or Canadians. Uh, but note that the young um, uh, researchers are catching up from China. This shows you uh, the top 10% of all AI papers uh, actually crossed last year, where that means there are more if you look at the top 10% of all AI papers, now there are more Chinese papers than American papers. Uh, uh, obviously, top 50% the same way, top 1% will take a few more years. Uh, we talked about the, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial environment being very tenacious, winner take all. Um, so while China has fewer unicorns, it has more companies that are over $100 billion that have data on the internet space. And that means they have a huge amount of data and they have a huge advantage compared to their American um, uh, core, uh, equivalent company, as well as their competitors in China. Uh, and also these companies growing bigger are coming up with new business models that are actually making the Chinese companies uh, quite innovative. And we're now seeing some copycats uh, in the US. Uh, we've now seen you know, Facebook make uh, several attempts at copying TikTok uh, without success. Uh, we're seeing um, DoorDash being a co copycat of Meituan. So the copycat began from China copying from US and now we're seeing copy from China. And actually, I see huge opportunities there. If any of you are thinking about entrepreneurship, uh, I think you should study the new Chinese e-commerce, the e-commerce plus entertainment model, uh, the Pindodo model of social plus e-commerce. China is now coming up with a new generation of e-commerce successes. I won't have time to go into them. I think all of them would fit the US and they can particularly build off of the post-COVID improved digitization in the US. We've seen the dual world. And I mentioned the huge amount of data just makes better AI. And China, of course, has a lot more data than the US. This shows you, you know, China has uh, 10 times more food delivery than the US. This was pre pandemic, but I bet today is still easily more than seven or eight X, a lot more mobile payment. I know now that in the US, PayPal and uh, Square are offering a mobile payment, but still China in China, there's cash has been eliminated. And all of that becomes powerful training because tra transactions by mobile payment is actually purchasing, not just clicking. Very strong power of the um, uh, indication of the labeling. Uh, China's uh, AI capital we've talked about, and then we've covered also China's techno utilitarian policies. Um, and, and again, uh, the infrastructural environments, whether it's building 5G and 6G, and or whether it is building uh, infrastructures in cities that facilitate autonomous vehicles or smart highways. And this is being advanced further since the completion of my book, China has announced a $2 trillion high-tech infrastructure plan called the New Infrastructure. It is about building out what's on the right, 
uh, 5G, industrial IoT, data center, uh, and of course, AI and data. And that infrastructure will make entrepreneurs have a much easier time. Whereas um, the American government chose to give trillions of dollars to the consumers to relieve their challenges for COVID, China put an equivalent amount of money to build the new infrastructure. And, um, and of course, China is putting uh, a lot of research, whether we measure by publications or by patents, uh, China is uh, improving. So let's talk now about since the publication of my book, what has happened? So in my book, I think we kind of reflect on the last three years and show you where we are. But going forward, what is the future? So this is the first talk in which I'm going to tell you I've written a new book and the book is called AI 2041. And uh, I won't go into details here, uh, but uh, I think all the questions you have about the future of AI in the next 20 years, um, including um, AI's challenges on privacy, externalities, AI and quantum computing, AI and singularity, is it real or is it a hoax? And um, you know, how, how the future robotic teachers will change um, your kids and whether Matrix or Real Ready Player One might become a reality, as well as the future of work, future of war, and post-scarcity when everything can be almost free, and the ultimate question of um, can AI make us happy? So this is a book with uh, 10 stories and 10 visions for the future that I hope will be even more uh, exciting. And it's um, now, it's coming out and it's available now on uh, uh, online bookstores. Uh, but coming back to the a couple of the key points I make, I don't want to spend too much of this session on 20 year predictions. So I'm going to pull it in to more like five years. What are the things we see? Certainly one thing we see is that uh, COVID has accelerated digitization. By making everything uh, digital, uh, it makes creates data and data makes AI possible. So, um, and also the social distancing uh, creates opportunities for automation and robotics. So I'm gonna pick a couple of sectors where I can see big changes happening uh, in China and three in China and one in the US that I think will create huge opportunities uh, for your future uh, jobs, employment, uh, entrepreneurship, or uh, uh, thinking about ways to benefit from these uh, changes. I mean, COVID is a terrible thing, but it has digitized the world in different ways. So first on um, automation, because of social distancing, China needed to make safer factories, safer warehouses, safer restaurants. So automation and robotics has really taken off in the last year since the beginning of COVID. Uh, from a China uh, country point of view, Chinese labor is now two times of India and Vietnam, which creates a serious uh, challenge for China's position as the world's factory. And uh, so China has a, had a concerted national push to improve and increase the number of industrial robots. You can see in the second graph, China has way exceeded any other country in building industrial robots to automate its factories. And of course, energy revolution is going to drive down the cost of, um, of manufacturing. And China has made very ambitious, I think the most ambitious plan for uh, going, going to uh, carbon neutral. And uh, uh, some companies are doing amazing things in China. So as China brings the cost of energy down, uh, makes the energy cleaner, install robots, uh, the China will be able to produce uh, more goods for lower prices because uh, the major cost of production is uh, energy, uh, materials, and labor. And this will bring down two of the three components, making China competitive and maybe even less expensive and higher quality than other developing countries. And this can be applied to many areas, obviously in manufacturing, assembly, picking. On the, on the first column, on the upper left, you see a Chinese innovative company that has robotic arms that can pick up an egg yolk. On the bottom is an autonomous uh, company that waters uh, for agriculture and it also uh, harvests fruits. Uh, in logistics, autonomous carts, autonomous uh, forklifts are automating movement of goods in the factory and warehouse. Uh, smart cars are now being applied everywhere um, in, in uh, airport shuttles, in the, mine, in the mines, uh, 
robot, robotic uh, robo buses are happening in China. You hear about robo taxi in the US because Waymo and Tesla are thinking about it. That's very cool, but going from any place to any place is hard. Robo buses are a hundred times easier. So uh, China is actually deploying robo buses in a number of cities. And uh, in, uh, in pharmaceuticals, actually a company in China has automated the laboratory. So the researcher can do experiments uh, without touching anything and the lab technicians are gone. And also the same technology applies for COVID testing. So COVID tests in China are incredibly effective because uh, there are a number of reasons. One of the key reasons is the automation of the process by robots. Uh, in healthcare, uh, there's a lot of details here. I won't be able to go into it. I would just say that China has every reason to lead the world in AI healthcare. Uh, obviously, COVID has brought people's attention about healthcare and the opportunities, but key, a couple of key points. One is that China's healthcare spend is way less than US in percentage, and it's got to catch up. And also China is the biggest market with a huge increasing aging population. So this is a big growth area. Uh, also, um, there are a number of things happening, such as telemedicine uh, that's now covered by public care. And telemedicine is another digitization that will create uh, data that is being kept. And uh, China is uh, actually catching up in biology, chemistry, research. So I think it's a wonderful, huge market where a lot of things will blossom and they'll be combined with uh, AI. But uh, the key point of this talk is that, you know, if data is the most important thing for AI, what's the status of uh, Chinese AI data? Well, in the US, um, I think uh, things like the HIPAA uh, regulations make it very difficult to collect data from a patient, even with anonymization and even uh, requiring user consent per use, that creates a huge problem because um, uh, if I wanted to donate all my data, uh, it's not, I can't even do that. I was, uh, uh, can, I'm a cancer survivor. I would love to donate all of my data. I don't care about the privacy issues, but I have no means of doing that in the US, but in China I can. And for people who care about privacy, there are ways to anonymize, to donate your anonymized data for general you good use, but not specifically for this use or that use. So, so China, I think, has obviously privacy laws, but it's not nearly as stringent as the HIPAA laws in the U.S. As a result, a public company, Edu Cloud, has now, uh, you know, launched a, a company built on a billion pieces of medical records, and it's trading on Hong Kong Stock Exchange and, and doing very well, worth billions of dollars. Um, in education, is another area where. Uh, AI and tech can be used to reach more users, integrating online and offline and AR and VR. Um, uh, we, we now have a number of startups that have virtual teachers. It turns out virtual teachers are better at teaching students of younger ages because these could be their favorite cartoon characters that make learning fun. AI can be used to customize learning for each student. If a student is stuck on some point, AI can teach multiplication very well with a lot of drills before it moves on to division. If a particular student loves basketball, uh, AI can reshape all the problems or many of the problems to be basketball related to make it more engaging. Um, AI virtual assistants are, are great for education. There are these, um, uh, actually China, one of the companies in China has not only built virtual teachers, uh, they build virtual students. So you're in a virtual classroom, like this Zoom room, uh, with maybe 10 kids and a, and a teacher. One of the kids is virtual, and, and it's proven that child, that student, actually livens up com uh, communication in the class. You're probably wondering, how do we render a realistic human child? But well, we don't yet do that. We actually use recorded video, uh, but that has proven to work. Uh, rendering a accurate video, I think, can be done in the next one or two years uh, inexpensively uh, to liven up the classroom. Uh, this, of course, still means there's a huge role for the human teacher to play, right? The human teacher is, is too valuable a resource to do drills and homework assignments and tests human teachers should be motivators and coaches and mentors and care deeply about helping to find the future of each student. And that's what the human teacher should do, partnering with AI that takes care of the routine part of the teaching. 
So that's a huge area as well. And, and lastly, um, look back to the US, um, uh, actually we talked about a lot of areas where China is strong uh, in automation, robotics, and healthcare and education uh, for using AI. But I think US has an unassailable lead at this point in enterprise AI because, uh, because COVID um, unfortunately uh, kept U.S. Uh, workers from at home for quite a bit of time, and that duration has digitized the workflow and made tools like Zoom and DocuSign, um, uh, Microsoft Teams, and, and products like that uh, very easy to use. And layers of new products like Snowflake uh, are, are coming in as well. So if we look, look currently at uh, cloud use, you know, China lags uh, uh, U.S. by about an order of magnitude. Uh, China will catch up, but it's way behind now. But if we look at SaaS and the use of enterprise software, China, U.S. is now 21 times ahead of China. And if you factor in all the boosts to Microsoft and Zoom and DocuSign, all those companies, it's probably even more. This was done about half a year ago. So, so I think China, so, so while China has digitized consumer space much better, uh, U.S. has digitized enterprise space. And as we know, enterprise space has huge value for companies to be able, able to apply AI and extract value from the treasure trove of enterprise data that they've collected. So now these tool AI tools will surely come out, uh, whether it's for human resources, finance department, legal department, for managing, for the CEO to have a dashboard to manage the company, and, and for, you know, uh, a business school like UCLA, I think this creates huge opportunities for students to see what can be done with this data that's now being collected by enterprise apps. Uh, can AI put things together and help companies manage better? Just as I described how AI is helping te teachers and uh, healthcare providers in China and factory owners, I think applying AI to enterprises is the defining uh, application for us to uh, continue its leadership in the world in ai application in an area that very much fits the success and leadership position that us has so to conclude i believe ui uh, ai will create unprecedented uh, value and wealth to society uh, china and us will co-lead the ai revolution and i see even more opportunities in the next five and in the next 20 years. Thank you very much. Kai Fu, what a fascinating discussion. I do a lot of these, uh, and I think I've learned more in 20, 30 minutes just listening um, to you. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions. The audience has got a bunch of questions. If I could just start out with a little bit of your personal story. I mean, you you went from industry, you were at Microsoft, you were at Google, you've been an investor, you talked about being a cancer survivor. Tell us about the dots that all got connected that kind of gave you this kind of insightful view about where technology is going. Uh, yeah, so I have been extremely fortunate um, that when I uh, went went into um, my PhD program, I selected AI. And I studied under one of the best professors um, in AI, uh, Raj Reddy, who was a Turing Award recipient. Uh, he not only taught me the basics of AI, but gave me the freedom to pursue machine learning. Uh, back in the 80s, this was quite rare. <laughs> now you're gonna run into a lot of people who, who said they've done AI in the 80s, but they, Rarely did they get to use machine learning because while machine learning is pretty much dominant in AI today, back then it was a very uh, niche kind of technology. And, and it was not the area of my professor, but he gave me the freedom to pursue something I wanted. And that has really taught me, um, you know, when you lead uh, smart people, you really need to get, give them latitude and treat them as equals. So I think that was a, a very lucky uh, step one. Uh, and, and then I, I was uh, very lucky to have worked at Apple, Microsoft, and Google. And I learned amazing things at each company. Um, at Apple, I learned what it meant to be uh, maniacally focused on the user, to do everything to please the user. And that, that was incredibly important to me because technologists tend not to think about that. 
uh, at Microsoft, I saw the management of you know twenty thousand people project as uh, Windows was built. How companies can be organized efficiently, um, and and how um, how large number of people can actually work together on giant project. Also, something I never imagined at uh, universities, where usually you work on one, two, three person teams. Um, and then at Google, I saw a new man, a new model, the internet model of where speed mattered, mattered more than size, where um, the company at the time tried to essentially eliminate bureaucracy by saying um, the greatest, um, what Microsoft did extremely well, Google did the antithesis. It says, don't build 20,000 uh, projects, let's build a 10 person project. And if we remove layers of management, small teams of super smart people who have a single shared goal can do more than layers of um, hierarchy, especially in the internet space where we can use the internet to test trial ideas, do a B test. And let's not, we don't have to be Steve Jobs to know what the user wants. We can uh, tweak products and figure out what users think and make them better and better. And that of course is the energy that, uh, the, the thinking that allowed China to, uh, to catch up because I don't think there are a lot of Steve Jobs in, in China, but when you have the internet as your experimental platform, a smart entrepreneur can come out with an idea, see what users want and tweak them. So these I think are my uh, fortunate American lessons. I think my Chinese lessons are the following. Uh, first, I arrived in China in uh, 1990 um, as a UN program, my first time in mainland China. And I saw um, that even though we have the same ethnic roots that uh, here are a bunch of people in a very uh, poor, underprivileged environment with no resources. I was uh, touched by uh, students who programmed on paper and professors who graded the programs by running the program in their heads that under such tough conditions, they were still working much harder than me. And I felt that there are all these you know, 1.3 billion smart people and hardworking and, and there's things that I can do to make help them realize their potential. So that has caused me to seek opportunities to write books and um, uh, actually, you know, you, you know my two books in English, I've written uh, seven books in Chinese, uh, mostly helping Chinese people, I think have access to, uh, uh, you know, self-improvement, uh, understanding yourself, finding your strengths and weaknesses, planning your career. Uh, those are some of my books, but also introducing new technologies like social networks and AI were some of my other books that have been published in China. So helping Chinese youth uh, realize their potential. And that has caused me to uh, build Microsoft Research for, uh, for in Beijing. That has turned out, I think, to be perhaps the best AI research center for Asia and, and trained 5,000 people over the next last 21 years. Uh, I also got to run Google China, which was a fun experience. And uh, there are so many billionaires who have come out of my company now. But, um, but, and I'm so proud of the team we've accumulated, even though the company uh, decided not, not to continue its business. And it created kind of my um, uh, learning about the um, uh, internet how to build products and, and also the, the Chinese internet, which is uh, becoming uh, successful and huge at a time. And then of course I found this innovation ventures, which really bought, brought, made a hundred percent of my time helping young people um, make their dreams possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, some of that at Google and Microsoft, now I get to do it full time. So these are some of the dots I can now connect. Uh, and I just feel very fortunate to have had the uh, essentially the best opportunity to learn from the US and from China. Fascinating, Great, impressive story, impressive story. Let me now ask you, you know, you've mentioned the impact of data and artificial intelligence across a whole host of sectors. You've talked about healthcare, you've talked about education, you've talked about manufacturing. You're obviously an investor now. The whole idea about what do you invest in when? So how do you know which sectors are gonna happen now? I mean, is it because you look at the size of them, you look at the potential impact of AI, how do you overlay timing on it? What's kind of your mental map in, in looking at these opportunities? Yeah, 
I think there are uh, three really important things. I think one, understanding technology is something that really is our true edge because other VCs are good at other things too, but really understanding technology. And we do that, by, we actually read academic papers. So we try to do two things. First, we try to understand all technologies that may tip in the next uh, two to three years that may, may become, may go from unusable to usable or barely usable to very useful, okay? Uh, second, um, we uh, try, we understand the weaknesses of the technologies and the requirements of these technologies. Uh, so those become preconditions. Um, for example, uh, if you want to do a um, company that reads MRIs more accurately than humans, well, accessibility to the data is important. That would mean doing such a startup in the US would be incredibly difficult. Uh, in China, it would be somewhat easier. Uh, so understanding uh, those requirements, uh, as well as the weaknesses and problems, I think that's important. These are technology related and I think unique to us um, because we, we actually at Sinovation have a technology team in addition to the VC team. The, um, the other side is that we want to come from the other side and look at uh, businesses and deeply understand uh, their problems and challenges and what needs to be solved. And, and, and also related to that, uh, what is their current way of doing things? Um, and, and, and making sure that as we think about a technology application in an industry, it is not out of some naivete that says, uh, oh, this should work, um, uh, build it and they will come, but rather than uh, we don't want to educate the market, we want to fit as much as possible within the existing infrastructure and channels. So using the imaging example again, if you came up with a great way to read MRI, I would ask the question, uh, let's say read MRIs better than most uh, radiologists. I would still ask the question, how do you sell a product? Uh, do radiology departments have a uh, per software purchasing process? What is their workflow? Does it fit in? Can they make, make big orders? Or, and also the question of what well, would the equipment manufacturers want to embed these technologies uh, into the software platforms people use? You can't just um, sell a technology. The radiology reading technology needs to be embedded in the entire workflow software and hardware. So those are some of the questions we ask and AI, uh, uh, AI scientists often um, don't, don't ask such questions. Mm -hmm. and, so if you look at some of the AI products that haven't been most successful, uh, what happened there, right? There actually have been a bunch of radiology AI companies. They're, they're struggling because hospitals don't have a way of buying AI software today. Now that can change over time, but you better make sure it changes before your company runs out of money. Another example is uh, IBM Watson. I mean, a great technology, great team, um, but they really, uh, in order to work, but, but they didn't realize there's a big gap between the way AI people think and the way medical researchers think. Medical researchers think incredibly high quality data needed to teach my students. Uh, so if you go to the likes of Sloan Kettering or uh, MD Anderson, you know, they're proud that they have uh, 120 cases of ovarian cancer to teach students how to treat ovarian cancer. That's all you need to teach people. It doesn't get better with quantity. You need to carefully select them to teach the students. But can you imagine teaching an AI with 120 uh, examples? You need at least 120,000. So those uh, things are practical issues when uh, rubber meets the road. And I think it's incredibly important for those of us who have experience in technology and in business, uh, really uh, uncover all the details, the nuts and bolts, and ask all the tough questions before we naively think this industry is ready for AI or this technology is ready for prime time. Excellent. Very, very helpful. Let me ask you the next question on this, and that's about geography. So thinking about where innovation will happen, and you've mentioned obviously luminary companies in China. Do you envision that a lot of the innovation, the customers is going to stay within China for, a, for the foreseeable future because it's a large market, it's growing, et cetera? Do you expect it to be sold outside China, in the U.S., in Europe? Give us the geographic piece here. Okay, uh, so I would first give the caveat that I still believe ByteDance's success with TikTok is not going to uh, be easily replicable. Uh, hmm. But 
I think that by dance will be successful because they now have a great product and now they're now uh, snowballing the experience. Uh, I, I think there are two major issues why uh, Chinese technologies will have a hard time going to China and uh, going to US and Europe. Uh, first is that China is such a large market. It's a blessing, but also a curse, right? Because the opportunity cost to build a product for Europe or for the US, let's say you are a Chinese AI startup, you are doing well in China and you're thinking about going to the US and you hire 10 people for that. Well, that same 10 people can probably be applied to extend your product for China without all the cultural and other issues, language issues, channel sales issues you have to learn to sell to America. So just in terms of opportunity costs, it's more, um, more profitable to deploy new resources in China than going abroad. So you usually only see companies when they saturate the Chinese market to go abroad, such as Tencent, Alibaba, and ByteDance. But that's going to be take a long time. And by the time you do that, probably you will have had you know uh, five to ten years of media coverage and TechCrunch coverage that some American ought to be tipped off and maybe started before you. That's the first reason. The second reason is that I think the the challenges in the U.S. and uh, Europe are very substantial. These are not just language and culture, but obviously some of the recent tension. Uh, but on top of that, uh, I think the Chinese um, uh, uh, people are closer to other developing worlds in the sense, if you look at the average youth, what they spend their time on and, and their typical patterns, their families and so on. China is after all a country that's emerging out of developing countries. So it serves very well to, to, to what India might be like in five years or, um, uh, or, or Brazil or uh, Middle East or Africa in 10 years. So Chinese products, I think, will generally do well in developing countries because China is a good leading example for them. But um, Chinese users' habits in the US and Europe, there is a, a quite a bit of difference and overcoming that difference is hard. TikTok has obviously done it, but I think that will be the exception rather than the rule. So I would predict that in developing countries, we will see quite a bit of success for Chinese companies in the next five years. In fact, I would predict Chinese companies uh, will become the number one country in which uh, software is provided, overtaking US and overtaking domestic companies uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, one final point related to that is having worked in a large successful American multinationals. Uh, honestly, American companies just don't value developing countries. Uh, all the energy is put on countries with larger R pool, US, Europe, Japan, maybe China, but um, uh, very little attention paid to developing countries. And that used to be okay when US had a um, hegemonic um, position in the market. But as China becomes an equal, it's uh, basically exposing a weakness that unless American companies change, and I think changing old ways are hard, uh, I think these developing country markets, which is you know, over half the, value, uh, the population of the world, is, uh, I think, for the easy picking of the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Let me go through a couple other items and I wanna to get to audience questions. You mentioned in several points about the importance of Chinese entrepreneurship. And you said almost it's kind of underrated from a U.S. point of view. Say more about what you're referring to there. Uh, yeah, uh, I think hard work is one of them. Um, Mike Morris wrote a paper a while ago in Financial Times. It was a little controversial, but I think what he said was correct. Uh, you may or may not like it, but uh, the fact is that the Chinese uh, entrepreneurs, most of them having come from single child poor families, uh, see their opportunity as once, not just in a lifetime, but the, the entire family tree of you know, uh, 20 generations, the one chance to make good. So there's huge pressure and huge um, hunger for success. And entrepreneurship is a great example of role model where Jack Ma and others provided a great role model. So I think this pushed the Chinese entrepreneurs to work really hard. Uh, when I take Chinese entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley, uh, they're both impressed by the creativity, but also surprised by the how few hours American entrepreneurs work. I'm not saying it's better or worse, but it's kind of the current situation that mm -hmm. Chinese startups typically work uh, 996 or 
007, 996 being 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, 007 being meaning noon to midnight, seven days a week. And these work hours, I think, by um, you know, American standards would definitely be bad for work-life balance. Very hard to, to have a family with, with these. But Chinese um, entrepreneurs, whether they're married or not, really do that. The other aspect of tenacity is this idea of winner take all. Um, I, I think partly because uh, people are hung, hungry for success, partly because China is such a large country with uh, so much VC ready to fund you to become a bigger and bigger and bigger company. Mm -hmm. um, and partly because large ambition, aspiration and greed that mm -hmm. push companies to never stop uh, uh, at good enough. So uh, an example I gave was when Meituan was founded, there were 6,000 startups to build, going after the Groupon-like mo mo model. And they started being copycats of Groupon, but Meituan turned out to have evolved their model into Groupon plus uh, DoorDash, plus uh, OpenTable, plus Yelp. So they cover it all. So the Chinese companies want to overtake the entire thing and build a huge platform on which it can service customers better and of course, extract more value. So do whatever it takes to become a huge success market leader um, or monopolist, if you want to call it. And, and they keep going at it. And even when Meituan clearly won the food war, became the food giant in China, it's now going after Alibaba, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and so, People would ask from a business school, what about checking uh, the power of a monopolist? Well, yes, uh, it is true that a, a monopolist can get complacent and less creative, stifle creativity and uh, jack up the price. But in, a, in a, essentially a dog eat dog world like Chinese entrepreneurship, um, the smart ones, the small companies want to take over your business. The large ones want to <laughs> kill your business. Uh, every company is living paranoid all the time. So Meituan never had a chance to sit back and say, hey, how do we extract more value and, and rip off consumers? Because the moment they do that, Alibaba and Tencent and ByteDance will come after them. So these yeah. giants are checking each other. Unlike in the US, Google has its space, Instagram has its space, Pinterest has its space, you know, Yelp and um, uh, uh, and uh, DoorDash and uh, Groupon, they are all, you know, sort of um, accepting the role that they have in an ecosystem. I play this role, you play that role, we compete and we collaborate. In China, uh, pretty much you just compete. And, and that actually leads to an interesting point where, uh, where large successful companies uh, have to always uh, be on their toes. And so far it's worked pretty well, but of course, both U.S. and China are looking at antitrust for the giants, uh, but that's another another matter. Yeah, let me ask you before I start with the audience questions. What's your view on India? I mean, obviously, India is a large domestic market. It's growing rapidly, but as a supplier of technology, a creator of technology, not a market just you sell into. Where do you think India will go? Um, well, I think India has huge opportunities because it has a large population and that has the potential of generating data. Uh, but that uh, market is rather fragmented, right? Mm -hmm. because, because there are the many languages that are spoken in India and also because of the larger wealth gap between the haves and uh, the, the, the people who are extremely wealthy and the others who are not. And, and a lot, much larger number of people living in poverty compared to China. And of course, now it has to deal with uh, still surging COVID. So I, I guess, you know, um, I think I'm obviously impressed by the um, engineers in India with uh, their capabilities. Look at how, how successful they are once they got to America, right? Leading companies like Microsoft and, and Google now. Um, uh, and I'm impressed by um, the, some of the entrepreneurship that is happening in India. But I would say some of the problems about the really uh, the, over, the overall economy, and um, I'm concerned, and also the lack of a complete VC ecosystem and just needed to support the entrepreneurs. And I haven't seen the Indian government put in the infrastructure and the incentives. So I'm, I guess I'm kind of uh, mixed on that. Yep. Very strong strengths and very weak weaknesses. 
Makes sense. Makes sense. Let me start taking this a huge number of questions and quite a few of them have to do with enablers and public policy issues. So first of all, on data privacy, you've talked about some of the challenges that US technology companies have with the data privacy rules um, here. Say more about it. Eric Schmidt kind of talked about, you know, broadly the US competing with China and implicit was a bit of kind of the data rules. Do you see the data privacy rules lightening somewhat in the US when you see the potential benefit of AI? Or do you think this is gonna be a step function difference between China and the US that will create a step function difference in innovation? I do not think there's a substantial difference in how China manages um, Chinese companies on their compliance with data. There is a growing tendency to accept something like GDPR globally so I think in some sense that is pushing all countries forward and that's a good thing. Um, I, I, I think um, the, you know, the punishment in China is actually more severe for certain violations. Uh, consider what Cambridge Analytica did, um, but the founders are starting another company. There is no criminal or even civil charge, right? In China, they've been in jail already uh, over the uh, basically stealing data uh, that is against commercial uh, use of the contract. Uh, that is very much uh, enforced in China more strongly uh, between companies at the expense of consumers. Um, I, I, I do think consumers in China don't have a strong advocacy, right? Um, you know, you watch a film like um, Social Dilemma. It mm -hmm. really strives, strikes uh, a chord with many American watchers. In China, it would be less so. Uh, but that's, I think, a maturing of the Chinese consumer gradually consumer advocacy will happen. So I don't think that itself will be a big gap. Uh, but now I think the Chinese consumers are more willingly willing to trust um, large companies and use it a lot and, and hope bad things don't happen uh, and believe that when bad things happen, government will punish the offenders more effectively than, um, than I think the Americans um, Will so I, I'm not sure the the government regulation is the main thing. My main point on privacy and government governance is I think we have to give uh, the technologists a chance to come up with ways to resolve that. As much as I respect many aspects of GDPR, um, I think there are I mean, also many aspects that don't work very well at all. When I go to a European website, all the pops up pop up windows, you know, I just close my eyes and say, yes, yes, yes. It hasn't really done anything. It has uh, sort of uh, successfully said, okay, well, you clicked yes. So now something bad happens, uh, you click yes, it's your fault. That doesn't really solve my privacy problem. What I really need is a technology that pr protects me because no human can really understand what every website and app does. Uh, if I cannot, most users cannot. And and if these are hard to understand, then you got to have some way of uh, technologically filtering, uh, you know, using technology to provide my privacy, if you will, right? What has protected us from, uh, from viruses? Why isn't our PC and phone contaminated with viruses all the time? Because we've allowed technology, the antivirus software to protect us. We don't, we don't go read every aspect of every virus for me to click every download and read its, um, you know, its registry table to determine if it's acceptable. I let software do it. So I believe in the future, some kind of software protection, and there are a number of technologies being promoted, uh, federated learning, homomorphic encryption, uh, trusted execution environments. I think uh, we got to let technologists uh, contribute and chip in and not believe it's a purely regulatory problem. Makes sense. Makes sense. Let me ask you the next question. It's on antitrust related uh, issues. So, you know, there's more thought work actually out of Harvard Business School about competing in an era of AI that basically says there's increasing returns to scale with database businesses. Large tech companies can move across sector. They improve products and services, et cetera. But then you do have this view more from Europe, but somewhat in the US that said the big is bad that we gotta watch out for these large companies, they can become anti-competitive. What is your view on antitrust in the US and you know, news in China as well on antitrust issues? What is your view about where it is today and where it should go? Uh, this is well, certainly beyond my expertise. Uh, I, I certainly agree that uh, large companies with data um, 
increases their power over users and society, and that needs to be checked. And um, so I, I think whether US or China looking at antitrust is, is a good thing. What I am concerned about is the speed of governments that uh, can move uh, because technology moves much faster than governments. When I was at Microsoft, there was the antitrust probe that took so many years. By the time the final ruling and punishment came down, Microsoft was no longer that, that much of a monopolist. Google had taken over, you know, it was yeah. just too slow. So how can governments move faster would be one question. Uh, the other question, um, well, actually on that point, we saw the China uh, punishment for Alibaba came much, much more rapidly. Uh, uh, one, has, um, one can have different opinions on whether it's uh, uh, effective or, or not, but um, I think that speed is, uh, is needed. Taking forever to do all these congressional testimonies um, is slowing things down. I think, um, and, and the results are no better, I think, than the Chinese outcomes. I think a speed is important because, you know, bureaucracy, government bureaucracy can be very slow and technology moves at lightning speed. Uh, the other point um, I would make is that um, the current uh, types of more, more, more stronger uh, punishments, namely breaking up companies, uh, we have to remember these were developed in the days of um, AT&T antitrust or standard oil antitrust, uh, not so suitable for, uh, for something as complex as uh, internet giants, right? Yep. Because you know, the thing that AT&T did wrong or quote unquote wrong was just the power over uh, the entire telecommunication chain. So you break it up. The thing that standard oil did wrong was uh, going to things like gas stations that was monopoly extension. So you don't let them do that. But the, it's much more complex. And uh, I think Eric's point is that you have to look at a multiplicity of issues and not just use uh, simple-mindedly use old rules and break up Google and Facebook. And, yeah. and I, I do think that would be something that needs more care. And I, I think something new needs, we need to come up with something new to check the giants. Uh, yeah. I actually think China has organically come up with one way, which is a tenacious market, uh, mm -hmm. which which means let the companies check each other. But obviously it's not sufficient, but I think that's one of the mechanisms that probably would not have appeared possible even to uh, you know, uh, professors in business schools. Uh, yeah. But anyway, it's not enough. And I think more innovation is needed on how to keep the companies in check. The old ways um, just are outdated. Not effective, makes sense. Next question is on the future of work. And you mentioned in the 60 minutes clip up to 40% of jobs could go away, et cetera. Tell us you know, where you're most worried. And then importantly, what is the role of government versus business? How do you see that playing out in the US? Yeah, um, I, I think it is a huge issue because uh, while I believe technology revolutions will ultimately create more jobs and more exciting jobs, then they destroy jobs. That is, I think, a long-term optimism. But in the short term, uh, creation of the new jobs are yet to be known. We don't know what jobs AI will create yet, uh, but we do know what jobs they will eliminate. So we're kind of in a very difficult window where the decimation is uh, imminent and the, the creation is uh, uh, lagging by maybe a decade. So we have to deal with that. The other challenge is that the jobs that AI will tend to replace are the routine jobs, the jobs that uh, are basically copy paste the same thing. Uh, RPA watches over that and replaces that, uh, doing the same movements in the factory or mm -hmm. uh, moving carts around, basically very routine work. And, and I think um, the jobs that will be created will be anything but routine because if AI's most successful at replacing routine tasks, then if there are more routine tasks that people can go apply for, the chances are AI will do them as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the main challenge is not so much a numbers game, how many jobs are created and, and destroyed, but rather what are the jobs that people who are displaced can do? And if they require training, who will provide that training? That's why I don't think UBI, which is often talked about as the uh, ultimate solution, I think it's part of the solution. It creates a buffer for people who are displaced uh, to have an income to 
prepare himself or herself for the next job. But I think that income, a part of it should be required to get the training, to get a job that can't easily be replaced. So in my book, I talk about uh, what jobs can't be replaced. And we earlier in this talk, I also mentioned, it's about creativity, about compassion. And creativity means we need to elevate people to use AI as tools where AI, people create an AI optimizes. Uh, and compassion means a lot more service jobs uh, require human to human touch that AI cannot deliver. So how do we create those jobs? How do we provide training? I think these are some of the keys uh, I think the government can provide a, um, a blanket uh, uh, buffer that provides enough money to carry people over, but also requiring some degree of effort in retraining themselves. And mm -hmm. also, uh, I think government programs should make it clear to people what jobs are going away and what jobs are not. I mean, it's actually very well known. You know, uh, you and I know that a plumber job will be safer than an auto mechanic. Right? because the speed these industries are moving. And we know which jobs AI uh, companies are going after. And we should really have vocational schools. Our vocational schools should stop teaching people or reduce the number of people in jobs that are in danger. And the government should do that. And the government should assist the vocational schools to reallocate their resources and reprioritize their curriculum. Yeah. Uh, companies can do something, but it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult because companies have a responsibility to shareholders. Uh, a good example that I think went beyond that is Amazon. I know sometimes it's controversial because uh, Jeff Bezos says a lot of things, but one thing that Amazon has done very well is provide uh, a program that retrains its employees. They will provide up to four years of training at about $12,000 per year for jobs that are not easily uh, replaceable jobs like uh, nurses or uh, uh, aeronautic uh, repair, mm -hmm. jobs that they don't require you, know, you to become a scientist or anything, but they do, build, uh, they do train you for jobs that uh, robots and AI cannot easily do. But I think it's also difficult for companies uh, to afford this program because Amazon is essentially saying, if you're an Amazon employee, we will train you, even if it's training you for a job that Amazon doesn't have. And to me, this program at least, uh, is, uh, I think, a demonstration of altruism and caring, ultimate care for the employees. Yeah. How do you overlay the geographic issue on job displacement? So in the U.S., I remember mm -hmm. reading a statistic on truck drivers. If you assume there's going to be autonomous trucks, there is a percentage of the population 10 times more truck drivers per capita in Missouri than there are in California. Yeah. So is the burden on the worker to relocate to California if the jobs are being created? How do you think about the geographic displacement? Uh, geographic is a, is a tough one. Um, I, I think um, given the degree of displacement that I believe will happen, uh, people will need to be more open to, uh, to, to, to moving. Um, and, and, but I think also another big issue is I saw the segment, I think uh, PBS did on, uh, on, on this job displacement and they talked to a number of truck drivers. The other big issue is if, uh, if truck driving uh, starts to being taken over by AI and the most, most of the new jobs are in the service industry, such as elderly care, uh, a lot of the truck drivers respond that there's no way they would do that job. Mm -hmm. And that creates another challenge. And then it creates a family challenge because uh, assuming the truck driver is a man and assuming he doesn't want to do the job, then and then assuming jobs available are service jobs like elderly care, the family may be shifted and disrupted where now the wife who may have been a homemaker or some other profession now needs to provide for the family because um, she might be viewed as uh, someone who's more open to elderly care. So I think it creates um, a lot of tearing uh, based on the geographical uh, job type, uh, family, um, uh, shift of burden between husband and wife. Uh, I, I think these are much larger than, than we imagine. Yeah. Uh, they're also incredibly hard programs for governments to pass because, you know, and, you know I, I saw, you know, trillion dollar funding in the US went reasonably smoothly a couple of times now. But that's because of COVID. On issues like this, I think many 
uh, congressmen in the U.S. would say, hey, I don't see employment uh, dropping dramatically. Why? I'm, I'm not, I don't believe it's happening. I won't, I won't believe it until it happens. But by that time, it'll be too late. So it's, it's, it's very tough. Yep. Is it fair to say that China is actually better equipped to manage the future of work disruptions that are going to happen than certainly a more laissez-faire system like the U.S.? Uh, yes, I think so. I think that is true. Uh, China has had a history of managing transitions from the agriculture to manufacturing shifts that create a lot of challenges and disruptions. And China basically had a state-driven plan to uh, reassign many of the workers and retrain some of the workers. Uh, mm -hmm. It was still very disruptive to society, but it did emerge successful. Uh, the, the challenge for China though is back then when it did the agriculture to manufacturing uh, transition, uh, most of the jobs were state-owned enterprises. So the government had stronger control over them. Now there are many more private jobs too. So it wouldn't be easy at all for China, but I would think the Chinese people would um, believe and accept um, some government arrangement uh, mm. more readily than the uh, American counterpart. Yep. Um, last question from the audience, and then I want to do a, a summary here, is about standards. And again, it goes back to some of the comments that Eric Schmidt has made about what the U.S. needs to do to kind of compete and do well in an AI environment. Do you basically believe that there's going to be a bifurcation of internet standards, 5G standards, et cetera, that's going to put China and the U.S. on separate paths? Or do you see there's some convergence that can and should happen? Uh, I hope uh, both countries uh, will converge on a pragmatic plan. Uh, there will be some areas where U.S. may choose to isolate its supply chain and own its supply chain. There may be some areas for national defense or national security issues. Uh, there, there may be some inefficiency created to, uh, to improve those metrics. But I, I believe uh, most issues are commercial and are not about national security. And countries and companies want to be pragmatic. They don't want to pay more than they have to. They don't want bifurcate standards that will uh, cost more for everyone. And, and also, I believe the efforts to uh, decouple uh, have not been successful. I think China actually is becoming a stronger supplier to the world um, uh, for, for commercial products. And I think that, uh, I think people should apply more pragmatism and kind of use, use some um, uh, decoupling um, only on issues that truly relate to national um, security and not overextended because a world divided, I think is uh, not good for anybody. Yeah, well said, well said. Let me do this, Kaifu. I always like to summarize my own takeaways from the presentation and let you at the end of it either upgrade or share any parting comments um, you've got. I got a, three pages of notes here. I mean, this has been terrific. Um, number one, your defining message about AI as Excel on steroids, about data as being the new oil, as China having an environment where it can create and capture and utilize data that allows lots of innovation to, uh, to happen about the multi-sector nature of this innovation with AI. And you mentioned a whole bunch of sectors, healthcare, education, financial services, that this is not a single sector set of innovations. This is gonna happen across a lot of different areas. You had another message about the unique context in China. Um, you talked about AI, number of AI engineers, you talked about AI funding, you talked about government policy. But you talked a lot about entrepreneurship and this kind of unique, almost Darwinian environment that has bred uh, an ability to succeed and excel, et cetera, that is, uh, that is unique in, uh, in the market. Um, you talked about some of your personal learnings, which I found fascinating. Um, learning from Apple that was uh, uh, maniacs on the user experience. You talked about Microsoft, the understanding about organizations. How do you manage large organizations? You talked about Google saying that speed is more important than size. These are all kind of leadership learnings that we should all 
um, take away. Um, you talked about a mental map in decision-making, um, understanding the technology first. Don't fall back on the business right away, but understand the technology, the maturity, the weakness, et cetera, and then understand the business issues. What are the problems? Who is a consumer? How do they buy, et cetera, et cetera. And then a couple of last items, which I thought were very insightful, quote unquote, warnings for the US in many ways about the US needing to understand developing markets, that that's where a lot of the growth is and you better be attentive to that. And the US is gonna become maybe less representative its own market of what's gonna happen uh, um, elsewhere. And then finally, you talked about the future of work and the fact that this is a looming issue and we've got to be planned and thoughtful about it and don't um, kick the can down the road to a future generation or to government alone, that businesses have got to take uh, a role in that. Those are the messages that I got. I want to see if you have upgrades or parting comments. Uh, thank you, um, Terry. Those are, are great summaries. Uh, I think this conference is trying to do something that is quite important. It is bridging between China and U.S., two great countries that have complementary strengths. Uh, despite the currently challenging environment, I think these bridges are incredibly important. Uh, a case in point in what I talked about is how China has learned from the U.S., about entrepreneurship, about business models, to bootstrap the Chinese style of innovation. And I think it would be a disservice uh, if American entrepreneurs uh, choose to um, basically uh, close their eyes on the progress China has made. It, it would be a disservice from the sense that China is now learning from everything in China and the US and continues to do, do so. And that the American entrepreneur if you don't look at the Chinese innovations, Chinese business models, you're missing 50% of the exciting things going forward. So even for people who continue to have trepidation about you know, US-China relationship or uh, any other issues, it, it is important now that China has proved its success to uh, spend enough time engaging and learning. And I believe if you do that, you will see that a lot of what you hear uh, from the media, from certain government officials uh, are, are not true. I think China is a country with a phenomenal environment for entrepreneurship and uh, great ideas and uh, the people to people interaction and learning from each other is something we all need to do more of. Yeah, Kaifu, what a, what a great way to close the messages here, because I think this whole idea of one plus one should equal three, not one and a half, and what we have to learn collectively, and it's a great living example of the importance of this conference and you know what we do at UCLA. Listen, I can't thank you enough. I have learned so much in the course of about an hour with you, and I thank you on behalf of all of our attendees, our faculty, everybody. Big thank you, and I hope we can have you come back again soon. Thank you. That'd be great. Bye-bye.